This week we're going to, uh, to study the life of Calvin. This is the, the second week that we have entered into a, a new phase in our study of church history. So we're now in the Reformation. If you remember back to the first 13 classes, you know that the first, oh, what are the numbers? The first eight, seven or eight uh, classes dealt with the early church, the first uh, four or 500 years of church history. And then the next section we went into was the medieval church or the church in the Middle Ages, which runs from roughly the year five to uh, five, four, five, six hundred until uh, the year 1500. So now we're in the second week of our study of the Reformation. If you remember the last class, we looked at the life of Martin Luther and Lutheranism. So Luther the man and then his theology and also the movement that that flowed, uh, that flowed after him and, and followed on from him. And so now we're going to look at the, the next major figure of the Reformation. There were a lot of significant figures, but uh, John Calvin was certainly one of those. And then next week, we're going to look at the Reformation in England, right? So Luther and Calvin were the continental uh, reformers. What does continental mean? Europe, Europe that's right. They, they're on the continent. And uh, next week, we're going to look at the Reformation in England and a little bit in Scotland. And we'll see, we'll learn about Henry VIII and the Puritans and nonconformity and uh, and those sorts of things. Well, let me ask you this question. Uh, How many of you uh, have a a close friend and if you died, you can imagine them saying something like this about you? I have been a witness of his or her life. For 16 years, and I think I'm fully entitled to say that in your life, that person's life, there was exhibited to all a most beautiful example of the life and death of the Christian, which it will be as easy to slander as it will be difficult to emulate. How many of you have a very close friend who would say something like that about you? Well, the the man who said this, his name is Beza, Theodore Beza, and he was John Calvin's successor. This is a picture of of Beza. Uh, uh, So after Calvin passed from the scene, Beza uh, took up the cause of Reformation in in Geneva. They uh, They were very dear friends. Now, it's one thing for your friends to heap praise upon you, but it's another thing if one of your theological adversaries does the same thing. Now, if you know anything about uh, uh, reform theology and Calvin and Calvinism, um, who was the theologian who opposed Calvin theologically anyway? What was his name? What's that? Arminius. Arminius, That's right. Jacobus Arminius. Okay. Well, let's listen to what Arminius said about Calvin. Arminius said this next to the perusal, the careful study of the scriptures, I exhort my, my pupils to peruse Calvin's commentaries, which I extol in loftier terms than um, Helmick himself. This was, a, this was another Protestant theologian. For I affirm that Calvin excels beyond comparison in the interpretation of Scripture, and that his commentaries ought to be more highly valued than all that is handed down to us by the library of the fathers. He's talking about the early church fathers. So that I acknowledge Calvin to have possessed above most others, or rather above all other men, what may be called an imminent gift of prophecy. So that's pretty uh, remarkable. It's significant that Beza said something so complimentary about Calvin, but it's even more significant that his theological adversary, uh, Arminius, uh, did so. Uh, Now, keep in mind that uh, Arminius was only about three years old when Calvin died, right? So so Arminius was responding to Calvin's writings, not to the man uh, himself uh, face to face. Now, uh, Calvin's legacy, we might say it is extremely mixed, Right. It's a mixed legacy because there, there's nobody in all of church history that only has a good legacy. There, there, there are errors and there are flaws and there are black eyes uh, for everybody. Um, now, if there's one thing that Calvin is famous for or we might say infamous for, depending on where you are theologically, what would that what would that topic be? Predestination. Predestination. That's exactly right. Now, I think it's extremely unfortunate that Calvin is known for predestination and Servetus. We'll talk about Servetus uh, a little bit later. But I think it's unfortunate that his name is synonymous with predestination for, for these two reasons. One is Calvin did not invent predestination. The Bible talks about predestination. It talks about election. 
Um, and talk about God being sovereign. It's remarkable to me that, that we're going to learn about Calvin this morning. And my message this morning is actually going to be on predestination. Now, if you know, if you've been here at Pinelands for a long time, you can count on no fingers the number of times I've had a sermon that focused on predestination. Right now, I've talked about it when it's come up in the text. But I mean, is God sovereign or is God sovereign? So anyway, you're going to get it in Sunday school and you're going to get it in the message uh, the sermon this morning as we study as we study Romans 9. So Calvin didn't invent predestination. The scriptures talk about it, and many church fathers, including Augustine and uh, Thomas Aquinas, believe it. You remember, I, I hope, a little bit about these, these thinkers. Uh, I, I went back and I, I, I read through some of the Summa Theologica, uh, uh, Thomas Aquinas' great work on theology, and I was stunned at how strongly uh, Aquinas believed in this concept, and Augustine did. Um, as well. So that's the first reason I think it's uh, unfortunate. The second reason is that only a tiny portion of Calvin's writings deal with the subject of predestination, a very small portion. Um, Calvin's literary output was enormous. His works, this is a um, a, a Latin set of works called the Corpus Reformatorum, which is 59 huge volumes. So Calvin wrote prodigiously. He died when he was 54, by the way, 54. And he penned in in Latin and in French about 59 volumes. But when you read Institutes, and I I should have brought my copy of Institutes in here, um, only about 4% of Institutes directly deals with things like predestination. See? So it's not really fair that Calvin, or it's not fair at all that Calvin is is mainly known for that. Well, uh, similar to Luther, we're going to do an outline that, that, uh, that is uh, just like how we did Luther. First, we'll look at his life. Second, his reforms. And then third, his legacy. All right, so first, we'll start on Calvin's life. Jehan Calvin, if you, anyone here know French? I think that's how you would, how would you pronounce that, Leslie? Um, yeah, Jehan Calvin. Calvin, something like that? Yeah, yeah. Well, anyway, that, that, that was... Calvin. Okay, very good. Well, anyway, that's the French name, but John Calvin was born in Noyon, France, July 10th, 1509. Um, Now, when Calvin was born, Luther was about 27. So Luther was well into his his Reformation uh, career, or excuse me, he was not into his Reformation yet, but he had begun lecturing in in theology, and it would be a few years later that he would nail the, the uh, 95 Theses on the door at, at Wittenberg. So they were about, think of uh, Luther and Tyndale as uh, first generation reformers, and Calvin was in, the, was in the second generation after that. Now, we know very little about Calvin's early life. We know that when he was 14, his dad sent him to the University of Paris to study theology. Um, in these years, Calvin mastered Latin and Greek, and five years later, his dad instructed him to leave studying theology and study law at these other schools, which he, he did. So Calvin graduated with a law degree, and he looked forward to uh, the, the comfortable living that the law would, uh, was going to provide him. But what happened was two years later, when Calvin was 21, his father passed away, and Calvin left the study of law because he realized he liked studying the classics when he was, he was studying Latin and Greek. That was kind of his first love. He returned to the study of classics. And when he was only 23 years old, he published a commentary on Seneca, right? So Seneca was one of these ancient uh, philosophers. And uh, so he was a precocious fellow. Um, when Calvin was 23, 24 years old, he started to hear some of these things uh, about the, the Reformation around 1530, 1531. And he began to be influenced and he uh, he left his traditional Catholicism that he was raised in. And he would, I think he would say that he was born again at that point. That was when he actually came to living faith in Jesus. And listen to what Calvin wrote as the Reformation uh, teaching started to, uh, to get into his soul. He wrote, a very different form of doctrine started up. Not one which led us away from the Christian profession, but one which brought it back to its fountain, to its original purity. This is one of the essential keys of the idea of the Reformation. Ponder that for a moment. The Reformation was not some new idea. The Reformation was returning to the Bible. In fact, I would say the Reformation was returning to that which was taught from Genesis 
all the way until Revelation. Okay, so this is not novelty, you know, and, and it's interesting. Sorry, it's going to be hard for me to contain myself. What, what's interesting is that so many of the reformers quoted the early church fathers. They quoted Augustine constantly. Now, why would they quote Augustine constantly? Well, right. They agreed with them. They agreed with them. Now, they, of course, they quoted the Bible constantly, but they they quoted Augustine a lot. You know why? It was their way of showing that we are not being novel. What we're teaching in the 16th century is not novel. Go back to Augustine. Augustine taught this as well. It is the church that has departed over the last thousand years. Do you see the significance of that? Right. So so they made they the, the reformers love to go back to the early church fathers. Right. To the, the patristic period is what we call it. So that they could show that what we're teaching is not novel. This is not some new idea. This is not only what the Bible teaches. It's what the early church taught. But it's the, the, the Roman Catholic Church that has departed from that. Yes, so Doug. The, church, the Catholic Church would have highly esteemed Augustine too, right? Yeah, well, um, on paper. <laughs> but I mean, they're, appealing, they're almost appealing to the same figure, if you will. Not just the scriptures, but certainly somebody else in yes. Catholic Church's history. Right. The difference or the, 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 the nuance in there is that the, the Catholic Church, the, the, the doctrine developed. Right. And, and the Reformers were saying it is developed and changed in a way that is unbiblical and out of sync with the early church fathers. So you had this accretion of error that built up over the, over the thousand year period. So they didn't just leave the scriptures, they left Augustine. They, they, they left Augustine. Fathers. That's right. That's right. And it doesn't. Uh, it, it kind of shows what really is in a person's motivation when you show them those things and they say, eh, what of it? So if you actually read Augustine and Aquinas and quote it to, to Roman Catholics today, to ones who are informed, they just say, eh, they, like that didn't hurt at all that I'm out of sync with them because I'm in sync with the Catholic Church today. That's what they would, that's what they would care about. All right, so anyway, let's get back to the quote. So this new form of, uh, excuse me, a different form of doctrine started up. Not one that took us away from Christianity, but brought it back to its original fountain of purity. Offended by the novelty, Calvin wrote, I lent an unwilling ear, and at first, I confess, strenuously and passionate, re passionately resisted it, to confess that I had all my life long been in ignorance and error. But then he says, what gradually happened is, at length I perceived as if light had broken in upon me in what a sty, a, you know, a mass of error I had wallowed in and how much pollution and impurity I had contracted. Being exceedingly alarmed at the misery into which I had fallen, I made it my first business to take myself to your way, O oh God. So you see, this was Calvin describing the light of God breaking into his soul for the first time. And it came primarily through the scriptures, just like with Luther, right? It was when Luther was lecturing on Psalms, on Romans, that he, he saw that this gospel of the Bible is different from the gospel that's being taught by the Catholic Church. Now, to give you an idea of what a genius he was, within three years of this moment, he wrote his first edition of the Institutes of the Christian Religion. So he was only uh, 27 years old. <laughs> he was 27 years old in 1536 when he published it. It was his theological masterpiece. And it would go on. He would, uh, he would uh, revise it every few years until 1559. It was kind of the definitive edition of the Institutes, five years before he died. There was a uh, back when Princeton Seminary uh, held to the biblical gospel. Uh, there was a, a professor there by the name of B.B. Warfield. So he's a very well-known uh, reform theologian, a Calvinist theologian. And Warfield wrote, wrote this about the effect that Calvin's conversion had on him. Now, bear in mind, before I show you this, that he published his commentary on Seneca before he came to faith. And then he published the Institutes after he came to faith. What was the difference in the way he was concerned about the popularity of the book? Listen to what he wrote. Oh, there's a, that's the copy of the first edition of the Institutes. B.B. Warfield wrote this. <clears throat> it's interesting to observe the change, which in the meantime had come over Calvin's attitude toward his writings. When he wrote his commentary on Seneca's treatise, his first and last humanistic work, 
He was quivering with anxiety for the success of his book. He wanted to know how it was selling, whether it was being talked about and what people thought of it. He was proud of his performance. He was zealous to reap the fruits of his labor. He was eager for his legitimate reward. Only four years have passed, and he issues his first Protestant publication. It is the Immortal Institutes of the Christian Religion in its first state, its first edition, free from all such tremors. He is living at Basel under an assumed name, a fake name, and is fully content that no one of his acquaintances shall know him to be the author of the book which was creating such a stir in the world. He hears the acclamations with which it was greeted with a certain personal detachment. He had sent it forth not for his own glory, but for the glory of God. He is seeking not his own advantage or renown by it, but the strengthening and the succoring, the encouragement of the saints. His sole joy is that it is doing its work. Isn't that an incredible change? I mean, when, when the Spirit of God regenerates a woman, regenerates a man, it, it, it completely it changes everything in, in your life. It changes your motivation for why you're alive and why you do the things that you, that you do. He wasn't wringing his hands. He didn't care at all about his name becoming great. He wanted for God alone to be glorified. Um, so that was a little bit later. Let's go back to 1533. Um, Calvin was in Paris at the time, and a friend of his, a guy by the name of Nicholas Kopp, preached a sermon, and it sounded very much Protestant. And, uh, and so they were, uh, Nicholas Kopp was run out of town. They, they, they threatened to arrest Kopp, and Calvin, being his friend, um, uh, fled the city with him. So soon after that, Calvin returned to his hometown, to, to Noyon. He was arrested And then he was set free. He was arrested again and set free a second time for his Protestantism. And then he eventually found a haven in Basel, Switzerland. Uh, uh, Sorry for all the details, but this is these little things are are important. So for two years, he was in Basel from 1534 to 36. That was where he settled and he first published the Institutes of the Christian Religion. Now, um, notice this. uh, Notice the reason that Calvin published the Institutes. It was, it was not just to, to, to blast the trumpet of predestination, right? I've already shown you it was a tiny little part of the Institutes. But this is what was happening. Uh, Protestants were being arrested, were being tortured and burned for their Protestant convictions. That's why he wrote Institutes. Listen, um, listen to what Calvin wrote. While I lay hidden at Basel, many faithful and holy persons were burned alive in France. It appeared to me that unless I opposed the perpetrators to the utmost of my ability, my silence could not be vindicated from the charge of cowardice and treachery. This was the consideration which induced me to publish my Institutes of the Christian Religion. It was published that men might know what was the faith held by those I saw basely and wickedly defamed. That was what compelled Calvin to publish the Institute. It was to defend the Protestant martyrs. And Calvin wrote a preface to the Institutes to the King of Fr- to, to Francis, the King of France. And he gave this explanation for, he, he said, these people that you're killing, let me at least tell you what it is that they, that they believe. Um, he did it to defend these, these Protestant, uh, many of them French martyrs. So keep in mind, Institutes is not an academic treatise for the mildly curious. That's not what it is. It was intended to serve as an elementary in- introduction to the Christian faith. Now, um, I do wish I had it because it's this big. Um, it's like, here's the introduction to Christianity you need to start with, okay? <laughs> right? Uh, if, if, me now, I would give a pretty, the, you know, a, a pretty sophisticated person knowing God. Well, like, we'll start with this if you're kind of, you know, upper echelons, uh, much less something that's 1,500 pages long. Yes, Anna. When you said the Protestants were being tortured and killed, was that part of the institution or separate? Uh, yes. So there were, there have been inquisitions at different, at different, uh, periods of time, but, but yes, that's, that, 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 that's true. Yeah. So, um, and, and, well, this takes us, you know, on a different subject, but, um, but there, there were, uh, Protestants who killed, uh, Catholics for their beliefs as well. This was an accepted thing in those days. Now I think it's abhorrent. I think it's horrible, but that's, that's the reality. Uh, but the Catholic Church was known for, uh, I, don't, I don't even know the numbers, but it's in the hundreds and hundreds of thousands of people who were killed for heresy, for not being in line with the, the Roman Catholic Church. So if we're just counting numbers, there were far more Catholics who, who did that. But, um, but yeah, 
that's just part of the, this is, you all know, this is standard Christianity, right? Getting killed for your faith. I hope you've seen that. I mean that, I mean that really, this is weird today. Weird, weird, weird that none of us are being persecuted for our faith. It's not happening. Uh, there's not, there's not the, the, the freedom of religion in many other countries. We just aren't very aware of that. Unless if we read things like Voice of the Martyrs um, or uh, Roy Sneed, who was here last week. Uh, he's shared with me privately some stories about great persecution that he and his wife have undergone for their uh, work of telling the gospel. Um, okay, so after uh, Calvin was in Basel for two years and he published the Institutes, his desire was to go to Strasbourg, okay, France. Uh, this other city in France, and uh, he, he wanted to just be a scholar and to just sit in a study and kind of an ivory tower and write. That was his desire. He just wanted to write books in support of the, of the Protestant cause. So what he did is he went back to Paris. He gathered some family members to take them to Strasbourg, but the road was blocked to Strasbourg, and they had to take a detour south through a city called Geneva, and so the idea was, well, we'll just spend the night here and then go the long way up to, up to Strasbourg. Um, well, oh, I'm sorry. My, uh, my slides are a little bit messed up. Let, let me, let me uh, read this. Um, so when they were in Geneva, they heard this fiery Protestant, this, this pastor, uh, a guy by the name of uh, William Farrell or, or Farrell, um, who was preaching and Pharrell implored Calvin to stay in Geneva. Like, don't just stay here for tonight. Don't just stay in the holiday Inn. like stay here and be a pastor, be a reformer for this cause. And Calvin resisted him and said, I'm a scholar. It's, I just want to go and, and have my books around me and, and write my books and I'll serve the Protestant cause this way. Well, this is what Calvin wrote. Calvin wrote that he resisted. Um, he resisted until Pharrell Quote, bent all his efforts to keep me in the city. And when, I re when he realized that I was determined to study in privacy in some obscure place and saw that he gained nothing by entreaty, like saying, please, 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 he descended to cursing and said that God would surely curse my peace if I held back from giving help at a time of such great need. Terrified by his words and conscious of my own timidity and cowardice, I gave up my journey and attempted to apply whatever gift I had in the defense of my faith. So this ended up changing Calvin's life because he ended up staying in Geneva. He was scared. He said, gosh, all right, you sound very convinced. I guess this is God speaking through you. Now, think of it this way. If we think of uh, Pharrell as a prophet, Calvin was a teacher and an organizer. Okay, these are very different gifts. All right. Uh, another example later in church history we'll come to is George Whitfield. He was this prophetic thundering preacher. Uh, Wesley preached as well, but he was more an organizer and an administrator. You know, it's, think of it as um, you need the, the person who, who is the trailblazer. They just run right into the thick of things and, and stir everything up their iconoclasts. You know what iconoclasm is, right? When you go in and you throw everything down and smash it, smash all these idols. But then after them, you need sort of the cleanup crew who's like, all right, let's go in and we'll organize it this way. We'll structure things this way. We'll, we'll look after the details. That was much more the way that, uh, that John Calvin was. Um, and it's interesting that um, a far lesser man like Pharrell was able to influence Calvin so greatly. I don't mean lesser in the kingdom, but in terms of abilities, in terms of uh, aptitude, Pharrell w was nowhere near a, a Calvin, and yet he had this influence on him. Um, so Calvin ended up settling in Geneva, and he began his work of, of pastoring, of teaching and of preaching regularly. Uh, Calvin, he knew the languages so thoroughly. He, was, he, he really was a genius. He would just walk into the pulpit with his Greek or his Hebrew Bible, and he would just preach straight out of the Greek and Hebrew without any notes in front of him. Okay. So that's the type of, that's the type of mind that he, that he had. Well, the next year, Calvin and Pharrell, they're settled in Geneva, right? Their, their, their focus is, let's get the Reformation going here in Geneva. They drew up a, a confession of faith, Right? This is what Protestants should, should believe. And they drafted things like uh, requirements for coming into the Lord's Supper and um, exercising church discipline and these other things that the Bible talks about. But in doing so, they began to be unpopular. 
And eventually, the, uh, the council, I think it's called the consistory, the council of the city, they changed their minds about Calvin and Pharrell. And they said, you know what? We changed our minds. We want you out of here. We don't, we don't want you to be, uh, to be serving as a, as a pastor in the city um, anymore. So they were basically run out of the city. And then Calvin finally got what he desired. He went to Strasbourg. He's like, perfect. I didn't really want to do that anyway. You know, now I can do what I love, which is to read, to write, to study and to do all of those things. He was elated that this Genevan church had kicked him out. And so for about four years, he ended up pastoring a, a congregation of French refugees in Strasbourg, refugees because of these persecutions that were breaking out. So he served then as a pastor and, and, and was, of course, writing all of that time. And it was at that time he married. He, he didn't want to get married. He said, I think a woman being married to me would be horrible for her. You know, this guy just spends all of his time in the study. But he ended up marrying the widow of an Anabaptist who already had two children. Uh, her name was Idolette de Bure. So, uh, so he did marry. Um, she, she didn't live uh, for the rest of his life. She, she died, and it was a great uh, sadness that struck him when his wife passed. But after a few years ministering in Strasbourg, the Genevans, they said, we think we made a big mistake and we probably should invite them back. Sort of no strings attached. Just we'll follow your lead uh, in, in, uh, in reforming our city. And so they pled for him to return. And this was Calvin's reaction. Rather would I submit to death a hundred times than that cross on which I had to perish daily a thousand times over. Not excited. <laughs> Come back to Geneva? No, I, I don't. Uh, he had no interest in it. He had no interest in it. But um, eventually they prevailed. And he felt that that was what God was calling him to do. And then the last little bit of his life. In 1541, they prevailed and Calvin returned to Geneva and served as their pastor for 23 years until he died on May 27th, 1564, at only 54 years of age. All right, so y'all have his life? You, you got, got his life in your minds? Okay, well, let's look next at some of his, his reforms. Some of his reforms. Um, I, I already suggested something like this, but think of it in terms of Luther and Calvin. To understand Calvin's success as a reformer, it might be helpful to contrast Luther with Calvin. Um, Luther was the type of guy who thundered out his, his protest against the church, but Calvin was more patient, and he wrote about it, and he, he uh, brilliantly kind of worked within that to bring about lasting reform. And so, so what I want to look at, uh, out of many, many topics we could look at, are number one, Geneva. What did he accomplish in Geneva? And then number two, predestination. Why is he known for, for being uh, kind of the king of predestination? In fact, people who believe in uh, predest uh, an unconditional election, those sorts of things, are known as Calvinists, right? That's, that's where we get, the, we get the term. So let's look at, at Geneva. And this is my best effort to put it in one sentence. Why was Geneva so significant? Calvin's contribution to the history of Christianity is that he reconstructed the church and the Christian life from the ground up on the basis of the scriptures. That's an, that's an important sentence. If you want to understand Calvin, that, 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 this is a very important sentence. That's really uh, what he did in Geneva and his theology of, of the institutes, even the way that he commented on scriptures. All these things were very, very influential. But his goal was to just pick up his Bible and say, how can we put together an ideal society, a godly society on the basis of this book? And he took God's word, did his best to interpret it. We call that exegesis, right? What, what does the word exegesis mean? It means you pull the meaning what? You pull the meaning out of it. You're taking God's word, pulling the meaning out and applying it to your own heart, to your own life. As opposed to eisegesis, that's you put the meaning in it, right? You read the text and you just give your own meaning to it instead of, instead of the Bible's own meaning. So he exegeted the Bible in such a way that he could do this. So Calvin determined to make Geneva a model Christian city. His goal was to reform Geneva so that it would be a, a haven of godliness. Now, we might get into Knox next, next week, but John Knox was a, a Scottish reformer. And at one point, he was in exile uh, when Queen Mary was on the throne. And he came to Geneva 
And he lived in Geneva off and on for a few years. And John Knox was very impressed with Geneva. In fact, he wanted to take Geneva and kind of recreate it in Scotland. So that was a lot of what, of what John Knox did. Well, listen to what John Knox said um, when he visited Geneva for um, about a four-year period. He, he wrote this. I do not fear to say Geneva is the most perfect school of Christ that ever was in the earth since the days of the apostles. In other places, I confess Christ to be truly preached, but manners and religion, uh, think of this as like true religious faith, so sincerely reformed, I have not yet seen in any other place. So uh, Knox would, uh, would say that he, he uh, was successful in what, what he was doing to, to shape and to fashion uh, Geneva. Now, <clears throat> bear this in mind. Geneva was a, was a success in terms of 16th century godliness, okay? It was a haven of 16th century godliness. Now, what do I mean by that? Um, things that were okay and accepted in the 16th century were, uh, were, are, are not the same things that are accepted today. Uh, should there be separation of church and state? Most, most Americans, America, we will say, <laughs> yeah, don't mix these. Because a part of it is, I don't want to run the, when we, we put together the order of worship, d- should I have to go to Cutler Bay and say, is this okay? Right? I mean, we're like, we're very, we don't like that at all. Now, in England, by the way, the, the, the state and the crown are, are, are together. The Queen of, Queen of England is actually the, the head of the, uh, the Church of England. So it, it was interesting living in the UK where they're like, well, yeah, it doesn't really mean much, but it's still true that the crown is over the church, right? But Donald Trump is not over the, over the church, right? Yeah. Thankfully. No president is, thankfully, okay? So um, in those days, it was not that way. Now, in Geneva officially church and state were separate, but in reality, they were completely entangled. In fact, I think it's fair to call Geneva a theocracy. Okay. What does theocracy mean? Theos means what? Right. And the Christy, right. Has to do with, has to do with politics in the state. Right. So it's rule by God. Now, um, has there ever been a time when a theocracy was legitimate and biblical? Yeah. When? In ancient, that from Exodus on, that's right. Yeah, uh, that's exactly right. In, in the Bible, the Old Testament was a theocracy. And that's really what Calvin was, was trying to do. That's what he was trying to create. Now, depending on your, your view on this, maybe that's good, maybe that's bad. But in those days, everybody agreed that that was an okay thing. Roman Catholics, Protestants. So we have to keep in mind that it was a very different time. What would happen uh, very often is... Um, if there was a, some kind of a, 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 an error in church, let's say a person committed a great sin, the church would recommend to the secular powers that that person needed to be punished in this way or that way. And then the secular state would actually enact the punishment. Okay? So just keep in mind as we're studying Calvin, we need to understand this is a completely different time. Here's another example. In the 16th century, well, I'll let you read this and I'm going to get a sip of water. Do you understand that? Heresy was, was a crime because if church and state are linked, a theological crime is a crime against what? The state, the state or the king or the queen or the crown. Okay, now the logic actually makes sense, you know, but the question comes back to, well, should the two, should the two be, be linked? That's the, that's the question. Okay, so that's a little bit about Geneva. That's what was, that's what was happening there. And, uh, People would say Geneva was a, was a success depending on your assumptions about whether that's a legitimate thing or not. Um, I, find, I find a lot of the practices, they're very rigid. It was like card playing was not allowed. Some guy who was actually a card manufacturer got in trouble again and again, you know. Dancing was not allowed. You know, well, the Bible doesn't say that. The Bible does not, does not say that dancing is wrong. The Bible doesn't say that card playing is wrong. They would have said that this is, um, what, what is it, um, not gambling, but... Um, uh, well, not, no, not, not entertainment it gave way to vice that it could, yeah, that it could give way to vice or like, like playing dice, you know, you're sort of letting fate rule things, you know, it's like, well, actually Proverbs says that the, the cast of the lot is from the Lord, but anyway, we won't go there. Um, I'm not proposing anything at Pinelands. Um, I'm a poker knight. 
Um, All right. So secondly, predestination. Let's talk about this for a minute. You're going to get a lot of predestination this morning. Um, Calvin is correctly known as teaching predestination and what a lot of people call double predestination. Now, double predestination is the idea that from all eternity past, past, God chose certain people for eternal life and he passed by others, allowing them to die in their sins. God picked some, but not everybody. Okay. Yeah, um, so there's, there's not a difference. There's not a difference. It's, it's like, ima- try to imagine a stick that only has one end. The other end's got to go somewhere, you know. So uh, there, there is a, uh, we could spend a long time on this, but there is a great, there is partly slander and there's confusion about these sorts of issues because there are, for example, Lutherans. Uh, Martin Luther believed in election. He believed that God elected not on the basis of anything except God's good pleasure. But Luther's followers claim to only believe in single predestination. It's like, well, but what about all the others, right? So that's the sense in which I believe double predestination is a real thing, that God deliberately chooses some, but necessarily deliberately does not choose others. That's the double. But here's the slander and the great error that people accuse John Calvin of and accuse Reformed thinkers of. It's the idea that, oh, oh, well, let me, let me put it this way. <clears throat> Double predestination does not mean that God works in the elect and the non-elect in mirrored ways. It, do, uh, it does mean that just as God deliberately chooses some, he justly passes by others. So here's the slander. I'll, I'll describe what I mean by the, the, the mirrored ways. That God proactively moves towards some and draws them by his Holy Spirit so that they are regenerated. And God proactively goes out and creates evil in people's hearts and then judges them on the basis of the evil he created in them. That is that is not what the Bible teaches. So that's the slander that do you see what I mean? That it is not the case that God works in mirrored ways that for some he works to save them and others he works to damn them. No, no, no. It is our sin that has brought God's judgment upon us, right? Now, I I grant, and it's a tough one. Well, but it's not really fair that I was born in Adam's sin. Well, you're right. It's really not fair. But it's also not fair, on the other hand, that if you're in Christ, you get Jesus' righteousness. That's not fair either. Remember, we, we, we need to expunge the word fair from our vocabulary when we talk about these matters. Now, that doesn't please a lot of people, but I'm, I'm sorry. It's the, it's the reality. Then we start getting into infralapsarianism and supralapsarianism. David, will you explain those concepts very quickly? <laughs> he said, no, no. <laughs> All right. Um, well, uh, I, I love what John Gerstner says. John Gerstner was R.C. Sproul's mentor for, um, for, for many years. Um, and there's a picture of him. Look at the, he's a very nice grandfather. Um, well, this is what, uh, John Gerstner says, I think he's exactly right, that throughout church history, there have really only been three options with regard to salvation. There's not a million options of how this works out. There's really only three in terms of what is the state of a human being? What is the state of the human soul? And the first option is that more uh, is that man is born well, humanity, right? Men, women were born well. This is the idea that man is born good. Man is able on his own strength and power to do the good and to save himself. Now, this is known as um, uh, Pelagianism. It's known as liberalism or Socinianism is a a later idea. Socinianism brings in the idea of that the the Trinity does not exist. Um, Arianism. Remember Arianism from early on? So that's the first possibility that, well, maybe maybe we're, 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 we're naturally born good. And, uh, you know, if we try hard enough, we can, we can kind of save ourselves. Uh, we don't really need to be saved because we weren't really born in sin. Okay. Now the main proponent proponent of this, what do you think his name was in the fifth century? Pelagius. That's right. And, uh, Augustine did serious battle theologically. His anti-Pelagian writings are about that thick in my, in my library. Um, but that was Pelagian's idea. Um, I don't believe that this is a Christian option. Like this is so far outside the realm of what Christianity teaches 
that uh, you're, you're welcome to believe this, but just know that I personally don't think this is an option for Christians because the Bible is so replete with statements that everything is not fine. We're not born good, right? Uh, so, the, you know, the idea that we're sort of, uh, uh, well, I think this is just now coming to mind. Oh, brilliant. I hope this helps. It's like if there's a fence right here, this is sort of the fence of decision. And good is over here and bad is over here. Pelagius would say, we're over here. This is how we're born. This is fundamentally how we are. But what's the next option, which I believe is a Christian option? It's that man is born sick. Okay, this would be known as semi-Pelagianism, Arminianism, or Wesleyanism. If any of you uh, uh, have ever been part of the, the, the Methodist church, you know that word Wesleyanism. This is the idea that man is, is born spiritually sick, so sick that God's grace alone and Jesus alone must save him. Man cannot save himself, but man is able under his own power, his own strength to respond to the message of the gospel and accept Jesus. Now, this, I believe, is a Christian option, right? There are Christians who believe this. They're known as Arminians, right? They're known as semi-Pelagians. Um, I, I disagree with it, but this is at least one option that, that you can get this from the Bible, I believe. Now, I don't think you can get it from all of the Bible. So this would be the option where, well, you're kind of on the fence, right? N not we're born good. That's Pelagianism. That's just not a biblical idea. But it's up to you to choose Jesus. It's up to you. And you have the ability to choose or to not choose Jesus, right? So you're kind of on the middle of the fence. Um, now, the third option is that man is born dead. This would be known as Augustinianism or Calvinism, which we've been talking about, or um, Reformed theology. This is the idea that man is born spiritually dead. Man has no ability whatsoever to please God or to respond to the gospel until God comes first and awakens him and breathes spiritual life into his lungs. Now, that is the view that I, that's the view that I hold. That's the view that our denomination teaches. Um, and if you were, uh, if you were not here three Sundays ago, you will remember, excuse me, if you were here three Sundays ago, I hope you'll remember that I gave a message about this, about how bad our spiritual state is before God uh, or until God comes to us and and uh, regenerates us. Okay, so any, any questions about these three or any discussion before we go on to the last, to, uh, to Calvin's legacy? Can you explain Arminianism a little bit more? Sure, yeah. So, um, so humans are born with the ability to accept God. Okay, that would be the Arminian, the Arminian viewpoint. Um, Arminians would say that man is born sinful, which that's where I say this is at least a Christian option. But man is not so lost and so depraved spiritually that he has, there's kind of a, 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 a residue, a residual goodness. And he has this uh, a moral ability to choose Jesus, to choose the things of God when he hears them you know, preached or, or, you know, reads about them in the scripture. Okay. So, so it's almost like Arminianism says that man is almost completely ruined by sin. That's probably the, the most succinct way to put it. Man is almost completely ruined by sin, but there is this little bit. And if you appeal to it in the right way, if they come to the Billy Graham crusade and if, and if the message is just perfect and if the music, if the timing is right, then it'll stir up the emotions of the person and they'll say, oh my gosh, I don't want to go to hell. I think I need Jesus. And, and, then, and then they have, it's reserved to them the right and the ability to, to reach out and to accept Jesus. Contrast that with the reform viewpoint, which says, well, man is made in the image of God, <clears throat> but there's not one little part of man that is unaffected by the fall. So morally, we are completely dead in our sins and our trespasses. From the time we're born, we have no ability for God. And if you tell someone who has no, no love for God at all and doesn't even have the capacity to love God at all, then what are they going to do with the gospel when they hear it preached? They're going to disbelieve it. They're going to reject it and say, I don't want God. I love being the king or the queen of my life. Okay? So that's, that's, so whereas the Arminian would say that man is born almost completely without any ability, um, the Calvinist would say no. It's not, uh, there is no ability 
And whereas an Armenian would say, you know, you're drowning, you're drowning and Jesus needs to come by in the, in the raft and, and scoop you up, you know, um, the Calvinists would say, no, you drowned. And a week, a week ago, you drowned and you're at the bottom of the ocean. And, and God jumps in and pulls your corpse from the bottom of the sea and speaks words of life to you. And just like Lazarus, you come forth. That's, that's the Calvinistic view. Yeah, Andrew. In those three views, where is the Roman Catholics fall in the first one? Or the Roman it depends on if they're a good Roman Catholic or not. <laughs> um, uh, Roman Catholics are supposed to believe Calvinism. Because they, they hold uh, Augustine and Aquinas, on, put them on such a high pedestal as like the theologians of the church. But, but today, Roman Catholicism is through and through Arminian, through and through Arminian. That, I, I, you probably have sensed my frustration that I'm like, Catholics know what you believe and then we can talk. But often I talk with them and I, I mean, I, I don't have these mean conversations. I really enjoy speaking with Roman Catholics, but um but a lot of times I end up having to tell them what they're supposed to believe. Like, well, you're supposed to believe this because it says in the Catholic catechism, da, 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 you know. So anyway, that's, that's where they are today is they, they would all be uh, Arminians. Uh, yes, Mrs. Boudou and then Rich. Well, I was just thinking that if you took the Arminian view, you would not be taking the Catholic Yes. Yes. The glory would have, I'm sorry. I think that's right. And at a certain point, I think it's fair to say that the glory is shared, that it's Jesus who did all the saving and me who did all the receiving, you know, it's like, no, I, I don't agree with that. Yes, Rich. Yes. A hundred percent. A hundred percent agree. Absolutely. At the end of the day, and this is actually your, your finger, you're putting your finger on an important uh, difference between Protestants and Catholics that it's, it's great. And it's helpful if a Protestant can show, or if one of the reformers can show, Hey, Augustine believed this, Tertullian believed this, you know, Ignatius of Antioch believed this, but that's not the final arbiter of truth. The, the only final arbiter of truth is, is God's word. Right. So if you can show that it's in the Bible, who gives a rip what Augustine believed? Right. Yeah, yeah. You know, I mean, Augustine was wrong on a lot of things, you know, just just like all of us. I think it was Calvin who said no theologian is more than 70 percent right in their views or something, which made me think, was well, that part of the 30 percent? Anyway, so um, but no, you, you're exactly right. That was one of the things of the Reformation. It was a return to to Scripture and to God's word. In fact, that gets us into this next this next section about Calvin's. Um, legacy. Um, what was his legacy? Well, think of it this way. Calvin was just entranced or smitten with the glorious God. And what it was what Calvin saw in the word that was so impactful. He saw the majesty of God and the importance of the word because it is the, it's the pure word of God that teaches us about who God is, about his glorious and his holy nature. So that led Calvin to emphasizing the absolute cruciality of exposition of the Bible. That is explaining and then implying the Bible. I heard uh, John Piper has a very good talk about Calvin that I would recommend that you listen to. It's online for free. It's called John Calvin and the Majesty of God or something. He, he gave it in 1997. He tell, uh, Piper tells this wonderful story about Calvin. That when Calvin was thrown out of G Geneva, you know, he, he left in, for several years with, with Pharrell. And then he came back. There was a break of about four years. He had left off in like Acts 10 or, you know, in the middle of Acts 10. He leaves for four years. He's thrown out. He comes back at their invitation to be the pastor. You know where he picked up? At the next verse. <laughs> he said it was just an interlude of his exposition, you know. But that was how serious uh, Calvin was. The, the idea of the church calendar and the church year, like, well, we do Lent. And then here's Matins and here's... You know, all these different things. And um, uh, the um, Advent, the Reformers did not do Advent, by and large. I mean, especially got the Reformed, like Calvin. 
Um, uh, the Sunday before Christmas, you know what Calvin preached on? First Thessalonians 3, 8. Like whatever was the next part of the exposition. So they were really allergic to this idea of, of, uh, um, of, of what they saw was, was uh, a holdover from Catholicism, the, uh, observing the church, the church year. That's why I'm a little bit like, eh, about the church year. It's not a real big deal for me. And people give up things for Lent. I'm like, okay, I'm not giving anything up for Lent, but, um, you know, but you can do that if you want. That's fine. So this was what affected his, his life. Um, there's a, a, a really wonderful uh, historian, not a church historian, but a historian by the name of Will Durant, who wrote... I think, 11 volumes of the history of civilization with his wife, Ariel. And this is what even Durant said. I don't know if he was a believer. I think he was kind of a a nominal Protestant. But anyway, this is what Will Durant wrote. It is difficult for us in an age when theology has given place to politics as the center of human interest and conflict to recapture the mood in which Calvin composed the Institutes. Calvin was a God-intoxicated man. He was overwhelmed by a sense of man's littleness and God's immensity. That's so true. That is so true. Calvin was, and and we should be that way when we read God's word. We should just see how little and how petty and small and insignificant we are in comparison to, to the great and the glorious God. He continues, how absurd it would be to suppose that the frail reason of so infinitesimal a might as man could understand the mind behind these innumerable obedient stars. In pity of man's reason, God has revealed himself to us in the Bible. That this holy book is his word, says Calvin, is proved by the unrivaled impression that it makes on the human spirit. I think that's a very, very good summary of of Calvin. I have to put in one other, uh, a a, a Baptist who was a Calvinist, uh, Charles Spurgeon, Um, He wrote this. This was his opinion of Calvin's writings. I have often felt inclined to cry out with Father Simon, a Roman Catholic. Calvin possessed a sublime genius. And with Scalinger, oh, how well has Calvin reached the meaning of the prophets. No one better. Then Spurgeon says, you will find 42 or more volumes worth their weight in gold. In his expositions, he is not always what moderns would call Calvinistic. That is to say, where scripture maintains the doctrine of predestination and grace, he flinches in no degree. But inasmuch as some scriptures bear the impress of human free action and responsibility, he does not shun to expound their meaning in all its uh, uh, fairness and integrity. He was no trimmer and pruner of texts. He gave their meaning as far as he knew it. His honest intention was to translate the Hebrew and Greek originals as accurately as he possibly could, and then to give the meaning which would naturally be conveyed by such Greek and Hebrew words. He labored, in fact, to declare not his own mind upon the Spirit's words, but the mind of the Spirit as couched in those words. Calvin was an earnest man. He was extraordinarily earnest in his preaching and in his teaching. It was so important to Calvin. I'll give you just a couple of quotes, and then I am going to take a couple minutes and talk about Servetus, because I I just have to. Some of them are, um, are, well, funny. He wrote, I consider looseness with words no less of a defect than looseness of the bowels. (laughs) So truth was very important to Calvin. For those who think, like, oh, well, he was this arrogant guy who put himself above others, and nothing could be further from the truth. There is no worse screen to block out the spirit than confidence in our own intelligence. He completely submitted himself to God. All the blessings we enjoy are divine deposits committed to our trust on this condition that they should be dispensed for the benefit of our neighbors. Isn't that wonderful? He cared about that. Are you loving your neighbor well? He cared about that because God cares about that. And then lastly, he says, however many blessings we expect from God, his infinite liberality will always exceed all our wishes and our thoughts. I think those are good reminders of what he taught. Um, Well, if the Institutes was Calvin's greatest achievement, the greatest flaw in his life was his consenting to the execution of a Spanish heretic named Michael Servetus who denied the Trinity. Were you all aware of this, that Calvin was complicit in the execution of a man because he denied the Trinity? Did you all know this? Okay, well, he was, uh, as I mentioned, Spanish, and um, he was a, uh, like an Aryan, right? He denied the deity of Christ. Well, let me give a little background so that you understand this. Um, In 1546, 
Calvin and Servetus, they exchanged dozens of letters and Calvin warned him. He wrote to another person with this warning for if Servetus came to Geneva, as far as my authority goes, I would not let him leave alive. Now, again, we get back to the idea that heresy is a crime because it's a crime against the state. Now, um, this is important. These little details in the story matter. So here's one of them. Deeply erroneous theology was a crime, but the right of emigration existed in Geneva. That's important to, to note because it means that, let's say David has some heretical view and he's in church and we find out that he has this heretical view and we basically lock him up in the room and say, we're going to kill you if you don't change your mind and, and you can't leave church until you change your mind. That wasn't the way that it was. If it became known that David had an erroneous theology, he had the right to leave. He could go to another country. Now, uh, there were times in history, I'm sure you know this, where you cannot immigrate, you cannot leave, right? And do you see how that would cause people who really believe these things, certain things about God, it would cause them to be executed, all right? So the right of immigration existed. Now, seven years later, Servetus wrote against the doctrine of the Trinity and was arrested by the Roman Catholic Church in France. Under a sentence of condemnation, he escaped and fled to Geneva. And Servetus, I think, brazenly came into Calvin's church and was arrested and burned a few days later. So he came back to Geneva with this warning from Calvin. If you come back to Geneva, you will be sentenced according to the law. And Servetus did it anyway. Now, this is very interesting. Uh, it makes you wonder about if Servetus was trying to be a martyr. Because listen to this. When Servetus was arrested in Geneva, he was asked if he wanted to be tried in Geneva or Vienna. And he begged to remain in Geneva. Note also that these other cities of Zurich, Basel and Bern and Schuffhausen all agreed to the sentence of condemnation. You see, these, other, these details are, are important. He begged, I want to stay here in Geneva. That's what makes me think that he wanted to be a martyr, right? Now, it was the law in Geneva, as it was across Europe, that people could be executed for heresy. Calvin agreed with the order of execution, but did not directly order Servetus' execution. This sounds like a joke, but it's not a joke. Calvin requested that Servetus be beheaded rather than burned, but this was rejected. You see, the Roman Catholic Church earlier had sentenced him to death by slow burning. Now, this is a, I know, it kind of turns your stomach, doesn't it? From the standpoint of somebody being executed, I don't know this from experience, thankfully, but I'll tell you, there is a vast difference, and this is not a joke, there is a vast difference between being beheaded and being quickly burned, which was an ex that was a, that was a sentence, and being slowly burned. A big difference is the wood dry, or is the wood still green? That's awful, isn't it? It's awful that I'm having to explain that, but there is a difference. There were people who were who were sentenced to a slow burning. Some people were were sentenced to a quick burning. Uh, William Tyndale uh, was strangled mercifully strangled by the Roman Catholic Church before they burned him to death. Now, I think that's, that's a much better way to go to be strangled. Yeah. How does this, uh, I just think, how does this con con relate to Christianity? I mean, how can we burn hmm. somebody slow or otherwise yeah. and still say we're Christians? Right, yeah, yeah. How can we sin and say we're still Christians? You, you know, it almost seems like an oxymoron. Yeah, yeah. Um, now, I'm not defending Calvin, but here we go. No, I'm just kidding. Sorry, <laughs> not a good thing to joke about. Um, were there was there capital punishment for heresy in the Bible? I don't recall. There was in the Old Testament. In the Old Testament, certainly. I don't believe that has a place in the New Covenant. That's where I think that, that Calvin was wrong. He, they, now, again, this was not just Calvin and Geneva. This was Europe. This was all Christians, you know. Um, but if you read the Old Testament, if you're, you're taking the whole Bible and saying, how do we build a society on this? This is what you, this is what you do. You know, I, I don't know. If, I don't know about other times when this. I don't know how many times this happened in Geneva. I don't. I've not heard about any other case of an execution in Geneva other than this one. Maybe there were. Maybe there weren't. I don't know. Um, here, here's the lesson, Peg, and, and for all of us, is 
what are the blind spots that we have? And 500 years from now, people will look back at us and shake their heads. Raise your hand if you shake your head that in the 1850s, it was okay to own other humans and have them as slaves. Raise your hand if you think that's wicked. I hope every hand is going up. You know what's going to happen at Pinelands Presbyterian Church in 2350? They'll say, guess what? In 20, what year is it? 2019, they actually believe this. How many of you think that's wicked? And every hand in this room will go up 300 years from now. So all that's to say, we need to be very gracious as we look back at the, the, the sins and the errors of, of other people. Um, I think it was not okay. I would have completely disagreed. Um, I don't know if I, I mentioned, um, yeah, Calvin, he agreed that he should be executed, but it was not Calvin who said, burn this man, right? It was actually the, it was actually the city, the legal, the city council that, that over, oversaw that. Um, so that's a little bit about Servetus. Um, here's the lesson is that all of us have feet of clay. Uh, hang on. Let me, let me go through these. Uh, we're, we're almost done. All of us have feet of clay. The best of men are men at best. And what areas of our life and our theology will our, our descendants um, judge us and say, my goodness. So it should make us humble, right? It should make us very humble. Um, and I'll, I'll end with, with this. And before I, uh, Marilyn, I'll take your question. Where to start with Calvin? You should read the Institutes of the Christian Religion. If you're a Christian, it doesn't even matter if you're a Calvinist or not. Um, every time I pick up Institutes and read it, I kick myself that I don't read it more often. It is so extraordinarily good. It will, it, it will, enrich, it will enrich your life. And it will just open up uh, your, your vision of the, biblical, of the biblical, biblical God. It will lead you to worship again. And again and again. This is the McNeil Battles. This is kind of the best edition. It's a critical edition that was published back in the 70s, but um, has helpful footnotes and scholarly apparatus and all those other nerdy little things. All right, uh, Marilyn, any questions? Uh, the killing that he, he allowed to happen was with the Christian church. The Catholic church didn't have anything to do with that. Not with, uh, not with Servita. If you remember, I, I pointed out that the Catholic church had. Um, so uh, he wrote against the Trinity. He was arrested by the Catholics in France and he was put under a sentence of condemnation. So the Catholic church were trying to kill him as well. And he escaped from jail and then fled to, fled to Geneva. He, 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 he denied the Trinity. He denied the Trinity. Yeah. Well, I mean, that's a, that's a, I mean, theologically, that's a, that's a big one, you know? (laughs) So it isn't like, um, this is, all, I hate to admit, as a pedo baptist there were pedo baptists like me, people who baptized babies who drowned Anabaptists for baptism. That's horrible. But again, this is the way that people, this is the way that people thought. And people really thought this way until, um, until much later. It was after the, uh, the Enlightenment that a lot of thinking about this change. The, the idea that you have the right to believe what you want to believe, that is an innovative concept. That is a new concept. It's like a, a recent blip on the map if you look at however many thousands of years of, 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 of history. I agree with it. I'm glad we live in the time that we live in. But, but we should be generous with people who come before us, even as we disagree with them. And I certainly do. Yes, Judy. You told a nice story that, um, in one of your sermons about the guy that saw somebody going to jump over the bridge and he stopped him and they were both in the same city. And, oh, they were both this and they were both that. Oh. Right. Yeah. 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 Did you see them as the other right. kind of put them on the outside? Yeah. It's are you, you know, United Baptist Church of the Reformation, 1875 or Church of the Reformation, 1878, 78. Ah, heretic. Yeah. Yeah. It's it's awful. It's awful. So, yeah. Well. And I've just been studying 1 Corinthians recently. And, I mean, Paul speaks about that so much, about these divisions among Christians. That's horrible. You know, we should not have any ill will toward, toward other believers in Jesus for, for anything. You know, if there, when the gospel is at stake, that's when we should, like the Apostle Paul, say, I, I don't hate you. I love you, but you are under God's judgment because you, you, de- you deny the gospel. I mean, Galatians 1 clearly teaches us that. But, but how do we treat people who don't believe the gospel? 
We try to win them to Christ. So there's never room for unkindness. Never room for unkindness. Much less burning people at the stake. Slow or fast burning, I might add. All right. Very good. Well, if you have any questions, then stay around.